ways. I hope you have your Bibles with you today. We're going to find Matthew chapter 5. We're going to dig back into the Beatitudes a little bit today. I've been struggling a little bit, and, and, and especially in the last, I don't know, the older we get. I, the bottom line, it probably has to do with the older we get, and it probably has to do a lot with the opportunities to just walk with the Lord. Um, as a follower of Christ, there's a lot of benefits we have. We get the opportunity of knowing that our sins can be washed away. That those things that we've done in our life, no matter how grievous or how, what we may say, how little you know, we measure sometimes sin, no matter what it was, it gets the opportunity to be paid for. It gets to be erased from our record. And when we stand before God, we have an opportunity to stand before him as though we had never sinned. Not because we didn't sin, but because Jesus paid for it for you. One of these days we have an opportunity to spend eternity in glory, a promised home. A home that's better than eyes have seen, anything eyes have seen or ears have heard or anything that's entered into the imagination of man's heart. We just never have thought about anything so marvelously good. And that's our promised eternity. But here, here's where I find myself these days. That the longer I walk with the Lord... If heaven were not even part of the deal, the journey with Christ would still be enough. Because there's nobody will ever take care of us like Jesus. And so this morning I'd like for us to sort of ponder what it means to be a follower of Christ and what it means for us on the side of that which we enjoy Uh, as a part of that journey. Blessed are, we get this list, these paradoxes, as it were, in the Beatitudes. If you have your Bibles, Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 and following, reads this way. It says, seeing the crowds, he went up on a mountain. And when he had set down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. We've got this list of paradoxes as it were this list that reminds us what it means for us to be a part of the family of God for thus those of us who chosen to follow Jesus Christ as followers of Christ what does it look like what 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 happens all, all for us when we do that and so many times in our world today if I were to ask even us today what does it mean to be a Christian to you There would be some of us that probably grew up in congregations sort of like I did that would say, well, if we're going to be a Christian, we're going to choose not to play cards and we're going to choose not to go to dances or go to movies or there's a whole list of things that we don't do if we're going to be a Christian. And so the reality is as our our definition of how that looks for us has more to do with what we do or don't do. 
It's an activity-based kind of things. And if I understand scripture, we're not saved by works, but somehow or another, as works become sort of the defining point for some of what it means to be a follower of Christ. Does that make, that make sense? But I believe scripture bears witness that it's much different than that, that it's deeper than that. And may I say more real than that. I've known people, you've known people who have lived all their life as good Christians. And somehow or another, when life got tough or whatever it was, they, just, they, they were derailed and they went off the deep end. Something happened. Somehow or another, the faith that was so real at one moment, now all of a sudden is non-existent. What happened? But I think God has called us to a relationship that's more about what we, than what we do. It's more, it's more than just activities, more than just words. As a matter of fact, I think when we look at the Beatitudes, it has everything to do with something on the inside that the reality is that cannot be tangibly fixed or resolved or done or, 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 or made by something we do on the outside. You can't conform to these kind of ideas. It's not about the external conformity, but it's about the transformation that starts with the end and then moves itself to the outside, therefore resembling and reflecting. Matter of fact, when we were to look at Romans chapter 8, and we'll, we'll get there to the very end today, verse 29, verse 28 says, for we know all things work together for good. Verse 29 says, we've been predestined, for those who are predestined, we have, have ultimately been have been." Uh, determined or predestined to become conformed to the image of God. In other words, God's plan for your life and my life is to be conformed to his image. What does that look like? If you've watched The Chosen, maybe that looks like us all growing beards, long hair. Remember the guy that was, maybe you've heard the story, the dad was trying to talk to his son back in the day when you know, long hair was in and parents were trying to get their kids to cut their hair and that kind of stuff. Today, it's more, it's more trendy. You know, people have longer hair and that's okay. But the dad was trying to get his son to cut his hair and the, and the boy said, no, 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 I'm not interested to cut my hair. And the dad says, son, you, if you don't cut your hair, it was time for you to get his driver's license. I'm not going to get you a car. You need to go in, the, in your room and you need to open your Bible and you need to read what the Bible has to say about obeying your parents. The little boy did exactly that and went in the room, opened his Bible, began to study and read. And after a couple of days came out and said to his dad, Dad, I've made my decision. Dad said, I'm glad you finally see things my way. The son says, I've chosen not to cut my hair. And the dad says, excuse me, how did you come to that conclusion? The, dad, the son said, dad, I've read in the Bible that Jesus had long hair and we're supposed to look like Jesus, so I'm going to keep my hair long. <laughs> and the dad said, that's okay, you're welcome to do that, son, if that's what you want to do. But if you'll read the Bible carefully, you'll also understand that Jesus walked everywhere he went to. <laughs> Just a thought. Anyway, it's not about the external conformity. It's got to be something deeper than that, more real, more tangible, more life-changing. I had a, one of our guys come by this morning uh, early, and I got here about 7.30, and uh, one of the young men in our church, he's older than I am, but everybody's young these days, but one of the older men in our church actually was sitting out about where I usually park, and he got out of his car when I drove up, and he said, Pastor, I just need to come by this morning to, I just want to bless you. And I said, boy, that's good. Don't, don't ever, doesn't, everybody, doesn't it feel good to have somebody just hug your neck and say, I love you? Doesn't that, it makes, when we, we all need that once in a while, right? And uh, he said to me, he said, I, I've got a gift to give you. And, I, and I'd seen this and I saw this little thing. It looks like a mirror, right? It is a little mirror. And, and he was sort of holding it this direction while he was talking to me. And I said, uh, I was wondering where he's going with this. <laughs> I don't need any help to understand I'm ugly. So I don't know what that's all about. But anyway, um, he said, Pastor, I wanted to give this to you because 
I want to remind you that what's on the inside matters more than what's on the outside. That's what he said to me this morning. And he turned it around and it was the fruit of the Spirit. You know, the fruit of the Spirit is love, right? What is it? Joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, faith, long-suffering, self-control. And I received that from him and I said, I, I told him, I said, sir, I said, I want to tell you that that's confirmation to me because this is the verse that God's been using in my life of late to help me to be able to look at my own journey and my own walk with Christ. And he said, if you'll notice, pastor, on the other side of it is a mirror <laughs> to remind us that we need to look within to be able to see if these are the traits that are dominant in our life. You're going to hear from Rick in a few weeks, Rick Kramer. He's a pastor from up north in northern, northern New York. He's been with us now for uh, probably about a year and is helping us greatly with a new process that we're, getting, we're launching into our church called Grow. And it's just, it's, I, I, I've never been so excited about anything in ministry, I don't believe. But you're going to hear from him in a couple in a few weeks, and I, I look forward to hearing you do that. But he he he's taught us a few weeks ago in Grow that the fruit of the Spirit is singular fruit. We oftentimes wants to think about it, and I, I I do. We've always heard it. It's the fruits of the Spirit. You know, you have all these fruits, but it's really one fruit. And we need to understand that paradigm significantly because the problem is is all of us have natural tendencies that we're peaceful people, maybe. Maybe that's sort of our natural trend. So therefore, we can always assume that we're connected with the Spirit because peace sort of reigns in our heart. Others of us love naturally. Others of us have gentleness that's naturally. But the fruit of the Spirit is a, is a culmination of all of them. And when we look on the inside, are those people pieces connected together are they evident in our life and if they're not it probably says more about the spirit of God within us than it does the circumstances on the God with uh, 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 circumstances of our life outside of us and that's why I think it's so critical for us in this journey for us to look into into the inside for us to take a glimpse into the mirror of life so that we can understand something of who we are. And I believe that's why Jesus gave to us the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Those who have understood that they are, they are depleted, that they're in spiritual poverty, that they have nothing to bring to the table. Blessed are the, those who mourn. The paradoxes of this time, the, the, the oxymorons of sorts, it sounds like it, they, these pieces should not fit together, but in reality, they fit together very well because it talks about the characteristics inside of an individual that helps us to understand something of our relationship with Christ and what it means for us as a follower of Christ to be a Christian. Let me mention a couple of things by way of introduction, and I've already been longer than I needed to be, but let me mention to you here if I can a couple of statements. The Beatitudes seem to build from one to the next. In other words, there's an intimate connection between them. The, the poverty of spirit or the poor in spirit is, a, is, the, is the concept of, of, of us understanding something about the, the emptiness we have that we bring to the table and that's this relationship with Christ. This next point helps us to sort of build that bridge together. And it says this, here the first beatitude, blessed are the spirit, is primarily intellectual. It has to do with our minds, the ability for us to be able to comprehend and understand uh, that, that we are spiritual beggars. And as spiritual beggars, we're blessed. But to get to, blessed are those who mourn. If you go back there, please. Blessed are those who mourn. It is the emotional counterpart. It naturally follows that when we see ourselves, what for what we are, our emotions will be stirred to mourning. Again, we're not talking about the externals. Everybody can put on airs. Right? Do y'all ever get dressed up? We don't do that anyway. 
This culture, we don't. That's part of the reason my wife loves to cruise. Because for one time in history, her husband dresses up. But we can put on airs. But putting on airs does not change the inside. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks at the what? The heart. He understands what's on the inside. That's why the Word of God is such a powerful tool that not only deals with the actions of our life, but also deals with the thoughts and intents of our heart. It looks down into the depths of our being, far below our actions, our words, or words. And so this paradigm, this, this, this whole concept of the Beatitudes has to do with looking on the inside and helping us to understand something that's going on within. Let me mention, if I can, a little outline to this passage. We're going to look, first of all, at the blessed paradox. We talked about the word blessed before. We're not going to repeat those things, but the paradox here, it simply says, blessed are those who mourn. It, it seems to be a very contradictory statement. Who's going to, be, who's going to have a blessed feeling when they're in process of mourning? And, and it just doesn't seem to fit together. But if we can this morning, let me sort of peel that onion back a little bit and help us to understand something of what the intention I believe this passage has to do. We first have to do it, look at it from what it doesn't mean. And they, uh, these are not on the screen, but a couple of things you may want to jot down or at least keep in your memory somewhere along the way. What it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that, that blessed are the grim, or the cheerless Christians. Those who walk around with a mopey face. I don't know if I remember... Uh, um, George Yance. Does that name seem familiar to anybody here? George Yance? Some of us have. Some of us does. Not too many of us. George Yance was a bass singer for the cathedrals many years ago. George and has gone on to be with the Lord many, many, uh, several years ago now. But as he was introducing a song back in the day, we're so blessed. He used to say, we are so blessed. And as he was introducing the song, we're so blessed... He would say, look, we look around sometimes and we, look, we see people who claim to be Christians and it looks like they've been slapped in the face with a dead rabbit or something. <laughs> and sometimes it's that way. That's not what he's talking about, those who have a, a grim emotion. We build monasteries for people who walk to choose to walk through life, de depleting ourselves of those things of life that would bring about a sense of joy or happiness into our life, thinking that somehow or other that's what makes us spiritual. It doesn't mean those who are grim or those who are cheerless. It also doesn't mean that those who are necessarily mourning over the difficulties of life. Uh, we all face those difficulties of life, and we're going to talk about some of that in just a few moments, but it's not just talking about those who find themselves in a, in a bad moment or a bad season or bad circumstances of life. It has to be something deeper. What is it? Let me mention to you three or four things that's in your notes this morning. I think, first of all, it addresses the fact that there ought to be mourning over sin. Sin. A three-letter word that trips so many of us up. Romans chapter 3 is a powerful, powerful passage. We know the passage from verse 23. Verse 23, for those of us who've memorized some, the Romans wrote, for the wages of sin is, but the gift of, actually that was 623, was it not? Verse 23, let me pick up, my memory is getting short. Verse Romans 323, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Some of y'all were going to correct me, weren't you? Just go ahead and shake your head, yes. All right. For all of sin comes short of the glory. But when we back up in chapter 3, starting in verse 10, there's some really, really powerful words that help us to understand the effects of what sin has done to your life and mine. Aaron is one of our great encouragers on our church staff these days and he oftentimes comes most almost every morning I can almost tell you what his first question to me is he's going to say pastor are you are, are you good I know what he means by that are you doing okay but my response always to him is this no I'm not good 
There is none good, no, not one. We're not good. Romans 3.10 reminds us of that. Verses 10, 11, and 12 says this. There's no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands, no one who seeks after God. Every one of us have turned away. They've all become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one of us. Sin has destroyed us. Paul says we are dead in our trespasses and sins. We have been, sin has separated us from God. There is no way to build a cross of chasm that, that separates between you and I, between us and God. We have ultimately died. Our life, we're, we're dead in our trespasses and sin. Sin has destroyed us. There's no life. There's nothing within us worthwhile because sin has destroyed the cup. And you say, Pastor, what do you mean? There's a lot more good in me than bad. Yeah. I remember back years ago having a, someone tell a, uh, an illustration that he said, if you took an omelet, those of you who like omelets, I love omelets, I, I cook breakfast quite a bit, you're going to hear about a cookbook in just a few moments and make sure you listen carefully because there's some cooks out there that needs to tell us about some recipes. But anyway, if you cook an omelet and went out and took the bacon and sausage and green peppers and onions and whatever you're going to put in our cheese, man, are y'all getting hungry? And you put it all together and you looked in your refrigerator and you're going to make a six egg omelet and you look, man, I've got six eggs, that's all I need, right? Six eggs and you start cracking those eggs and you got one, two, three, four, five and the last six egg is rotten. You ever cracked one of those rotten eggs? At that moment in time, you've got a choice to make. You can either take that sixth egg and put it inside the omelet and just stir it up and it'll be okay, Right? Or the omelet's incomplete. But you see, that's what we do when we try to offer up to God a life that may have a lot of good traits, but yet has some sin within it. Sin has destroyed the whole. Romans 3 carries on. It doesn't just destroy the whole. Verses 13 and 14 says that as in this process of life that sin has also brought us to the place that it affects our words. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness, it says. So it affects not only the, the, the container, the body, but it affects the words that we say. In verses 15, 16, and 17, their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways in the way of peace they don't even understand. It affects their deeds. In other words... Your entire life has been affected by sin. And it ought to bring us to the place that we grieve. Grieve. Partly in reason because if you were to go to Matthew 5 verse 20, just jumping down a few verses, you're going to find that as Jesus is talking about this Christian life, moving beyond the Beatitudes, He's going to say to the, to the quote-unquote religious group of that day, if you want to measure up, if you want to bring your best to God, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Profound words. There ought to be mourning over sin. Secondly, there ought to be mourning over the effects of sin on this world. I don't know whether you've recognized it or not, but our world is not growing more godly. Uh, it's, uh, it's getting pretty rough at times. Matthew 9, 119, 136 says this, Streams of tears flow from my eyes. Why? Because I look around and see that your law is not obeyed. Jeremiah was oftentimes characterized as the weeping prophet. Why was he weeping? Because his life was so miserable. As a general rule, no. His weeping was over the nation of Israel and the effects of sin in the nation of Israel. They found them, he found himself in a position where he looked at them and, and struggled with the fact that they had grown so far away from God even though they thought they were close to him. Jeremiah 9 verse 11 says, Oh, that my head were waters and my eyes a fountain of tears that I weep at night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Jeremiah 13, 17, but if you will not listen, my soul will weep in secret for your pride. My eyes will weep bitterly and run down with tears because the Lord's flock has been taken captive. It 
it doesn't take any of us long to look back into our family and realize that we've all got family that have been taken captive by the effects of sin. Families ripped apart. Lives destroyed. Children that have gone off into the deep end. It's been, we look around us and our lives truly, it ought to bring a sense of mourning because of the effects of sin that's, that's wrought on our families and are really around our world. But there's another aspect as well. Our mourning affects even a part of suffering. There's a sense of mourning and suffering that we, that we need to, to comprehend as well because in this life, we find ourselves in the struggles of life. Job was there. Remember Job? He started out so well. The Lord give, has given, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And you, gave, you give Job a little bit of time with his wife and those three, three guys that came alongside to be his blessing, his encouragement. And before long, you're going to find him in chapter 13, verses 20 and 24. Make me know my transgressions and my sin. For what hast thou done, O God? Have you hidden your face from me? Chapter 23, verses 3 and 4. Oh, that I knew where I might find you. I cry out day and night. Where have you gone? In our world today, we find ourselves so oftentimes living underneath the pressures of struggle, trouble, difficulties, suffering, pain. And all of us, all of us, every one of us, want to run from those. I don't know if you ever heard the name Philip Yancey or not. I would encourage you that if you've never read anything from Philip Yancey, you need to pick up something and read. Probably one of the most insightful men I've ever heard or read from that has to understand the issue of the value of pain in our lives. Anybody ever mashed your finger with a hammer? I'm not asking you what you said after you did that. But the reason why you said or thought whatever you thought was because when you mashed your finger with a hammer, it hurt. Do you realize pain is a gift? Part of Philip Yancey's study was actually going back and studying into the, into the, uh, the camps of um, leprosy. Thank you. Thank you. I, the, the word just left me. We oftentimes think about the leprous camps and we sort of think about them, their limbs sort of rotting off or their toes rotting off or even their noses rotting off and we think that leprosy probably has something to do with the skin rotting disease and what Philip Yancey has defined for us is that leprosy doesn't cause the skin to rot off but we damage the skin because there's no longer any pain in the skin And the damage of the skin causes the rotting away of the limbs. So in that regard, pain is a gift. It's a gift that reminds us when our fingers get hurt, it keeps us from doing further damage to our body. But I want you to know in our lives as well, pain is also a gift in our spiritual journey because it's in pain that oftentimes brings us to the place. How many of you all would pray fervently to God as much if your bank account was full as if it were empty? If, if health was really, really good for you, would you get on your face and cry out to God with desperation as well as you would if all of a sudden you got a C diagnosis? No, it's the pain of life that oftentimes brings us to the place that we have come to the throne of grace, that we find ourselves in this position where we realize we have nothing to offer. We can't fix. I've got a t-shirt, by the way. My wife don't like for me to wear it. T-shirt says, I fix stuff and I know things. (laughs) I'm a fixer by nature. Are anybody fixers here in life? Okay. We like to, I like to fix stuff. I, that God, I think, has given me a gift to that. It's part of it. I, I, I love to fix things. But it's the things of life that I can't fix 
that frustrates me. And may I say it's the things of life that brings me to the place where I cannot fix that are the things that brings me to the throne of God as well. Oftentimes I'll not go there unless I get to the place of desperation where I have nothing else to give. Blessed are those who mourn is, is the attitude that we've got to in our life where we have nothing to offer to this situation and we're mourning over the effects of sin in my life because I see the effects. I can't fix it. I, I'm mourning over the sin of my family because I cannot fix the problems that, that it brings. I'm mourning over the, the effects of the suffering around our world because I cannot fix it. Therefore, I come to the throne of God where I can then find comfort that I would have never known nor could have experienced had the mourning not taken place. That brings us to Charlie Brown's famous words. Good grief. <laughs> Remember him? Good grief. His Words has a different connotation than what I want to say. But I want you to hear what Timothy had to say here in Timothy. Paul said this, this saying is a trustworthy and desiring of full acceptance that Christ came into the world to save sinners of who I am the foremost. The reality is grief brought Paul to a place in his life where he came to Jesus, found salvation, Grief brings us to the place where we find ourselves empty-handed, not being able to resolve or fix the circumstances around us that brings us to the place in our life where we find comfort from our Heavenly Father. And apart from the pain, apart from the thing that brought us to Jesus, apart from our understanding that we have nothing to offer, we wouldn't have come there to begin with. Hence, grief is good because its effects is important. I'm out of time almost. Let me move, if I can, quickly. The mystery of divine, co- divine comfort. This passage says, for they shall be comforted. Let me give you three or four things. These are not in your notes. You don't need to write them down, but maybe you want to remember them. Psalm 34, 18 says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. In grief and sorrow, God draws us near to himself, and he draws near to those who are hurting Psalm 34 verse 4 says, I sought the Lord and he answered me and he delivered me from my fears. It's God using suffering in my life to draw me to himself. So God uses my suffering to ultimately bring a, an avenue through which he hears me, heal, heals my hurt, to draw me to himself. He also uses my struggles, my suffering, my, my pain in my life to bring me to a place where I'm ready to grow we grow better in trials than we do when things are good. R.G. Lee used to say this. If you may not know that name, he, maybe Agent Rogers is more of a common name to you. But preceding Agent Rogers was a tremendous preacher of the gospel, Dr. R.G. Lee. And Dr. R.G. Lee used to say these words, God doesn't sharpen a knife with butter. Now, I'm a Paul Dean kind of guy. I love me some butter. But the only thing that's going to sharpen a knife is when the rough edges of the knife is rough, you need something that's going to wear away the edges. And God uses the pain and suffering in our life to be the, the things that wear away the edges so that our lives can become sharp. And ultimately, I think in the process of time, God also uses our suffering to enable us or to ready us or to qualify us to minister to others as well. 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4 says, Blessed be the God and Father of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our circumstances, in order that we might comfort others with the comfort wherewith we've received from him. In other words, God uses difficulties in your life to help you to minister to other people. Lastly, and I need to move on, is the majesty of God's sovereignty. In Romans 8, starting in verse 18, it starts this way. For I consider that the sufferings of this present age are not worthy to be compared with the glory that's to come. From verses 19 following, there's this 
laying out of the Apostle Paul of what effects sin has had upon the world, creation, upon our lives, and so the entire world awaits, longs for God's redemption, the coming of the Son of Man. And then we get down to verse 8, verse 28. For we know that how many things are all things? All means all, and that's what all means. God works together, brings, God brings all things together for good, works all things together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So the providence of God, the sovereignty of God, is God uses everything in our life to bring it about in such a way that he uses to grow us up in our faith and ultimately to bring about good for us. Why? That's where verse 29 comes into play. If you don't have your Bibles open, I'd love for you to do that. Romans 8, 29, and then I'm going to go to this last little piece. Romans 8, 29. Romans chapter 8, verse 29. Just thumb through your Bibles. I don't know. It makes some noise. It just it work, it helps me a little bit. Verse 29 says this. For whom God foreknew. He also predestined, or we might use the word predetermined, or we might say it this way, God planned for. What did he plan for you and for me? Verse 29, that we would be conformed, thank you, Ted, that we would be what? To what? The image of who? Jesus. That doesn't mean that you might, you and I may grow beards or long hair. But what it says to us, there's a character about the person of Jesus Christ that God is seeking to work in your life to develop and grow out and to call out of your life so that we can become who God has predestined us to be. So God is at work in the midst of the most difficult circumstances of our life. And that brings us to two points of application, and I'm going to stop. Salvation will never be accomplished by trying harder or getting better. But only as we come to the end of our efforts and realize that our sin has separated us from God. There is a chasm that our sin has developed that we cannot build across. We might work hard to try to get across that chasm, but it's impossible for man to get there because sin has separated us from God. You cannot get there on your own. Jesus made a way, but you cannot get there on your own. And when I look at life and I look at the struggles and I look at the things that we have in life that oftentimes around us, what I understand so remarkably is that God uses those difficulties in our life to accomplish his purposes so much so that he's seeking to transform us, first of all, by inviting us into a relationship within, with himself and then to grow us up in our journey of life so that we might be conformed to his image. And what I've understood about life, and this is what I see, that the most beautiful Christians I know are those who have been through suffering. And has somehow come through with their faith of God intact. That doesn't mean that they always had it right all the time. That doesn't mean that they didn't have those seasons out. But at the end of the day, when they came through that journey, they, their faith is still intact. They may not laugh as much as other people. We all like to laugh. Their faces may be lined with care. But there's a beauty within inside of them, a beauty of Christ that's in their eyes and their voices testify to the amazing grace of God that has seen them through. And when I think about the attitudes, I simply think God is taking a mirror and putting before us and inviting us to look within. He doesn't need you and I to look at our neighbor and wonder about what our neighbor's doing. He needs us to look at us. 
and examine ourself to recognize who we are and what, what's lacking in our life and to see whether or not there's ever been a time in our life that we've come to the end of ourself and realized we were lost and separated from God. And if so, maybe you've reached out to Christ and found his salvation to be yours as Bruce celebrated this morning with baptism. Has there come a time in your life when you found yourself at a place where you're mourning over your sin, you're grieving over the sin, the effects of it on your life and your family's life, you're grieving over the effects of sorrow and pain and suffering, and you found God's comfort to be enough? And if so, do doing in those two first beatitudes, you have found blessing, not in your circumstances, but in the sufficiency of of the Almighty. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer, please? No one looking around. I'm, going to, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands this morning. I'm simply going to ask you this morning, have you come to the place in your life that you know for certain? Do you know Christ as your personal Savior? I, 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 I'm not asking you if you've been to church a bunch or if you've given tithes or been to Sunday school or whatever it may be. I'm asking you this. Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Have you come to the end of yourself? Have you found and recognized that your own sin problem is what's separating you from God? And have you bowed your heart before him and said something like this, Lord Jesus... I've never met up to my own standards, much less yours. And I'm sorry. I've sinned against you. And I know your son Jesus died to pay for my sin debt. And today, I choose to accept what he did for me. At seven years of age in the kitchen in my home, I didn't say those exact words, but I said something very similar. And what I found that day was the weight of the world of a seven-year-old boy is whatever that might have looked like was lifted off my shoulders because at that moment I knew I was God's child. Not because I was good enough, but because I accepted God's gift of salvation for me. What about you? And if not yet, what about today? Would you? Would you simply just say, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry I've sinned against you. And I ask you to forgive me of my sins, and I promise to come give you my life and to live for you the rest of my days. Would you do that today? Maybe for the rest of us or some of us, others of us this morning would say, Pastor, I know I'm a believer, but I've gotten sidetracked. The circumstances of life is sort of taken me off the trail I've let things in the world sort of deter me from what I know I need to be doing I didn't really intend to be here but I find myself months or years down the road and I'm just not where I need to be but I want you to know that God loves you he loves me and he, he takes the struggles of our life oftentimes to knock on our heart's door to remind us that he loves us enough that he'll refuse us to let us stay where we are. And he invites you to step back into the game, to reconnect. I'm not sure what that may look like for you. But if you know the Lord is your Savior, I've got a hunch you know where you, where you left off. And Jesus invites you to get back where you, to, start, to start all over where you, start, where you left it off at. Father, I pray for this morning as we gather in this place and as we prepare our hearts to celebrate the Lord's Supper, that you would draw us to yourself. We're empty. We don't bring anything to the table. Were it not for the amazing grace of God, where would we be? Thank you, Father, for giving us that grace. 
Thank you for promising to comfort us and come alongside of us when we get to the place where we're overwhelmed by our own sin, by the effects of sin around us, or even by our own circumstances. You promise to be our comfort, our paraclete to walk along with us. So God, use this time to draw us to yourself, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to invite you, if you would, to take the top cover off of your Lord's Supper cup. And with it, you're going to grab a little wafer. It's a piece of unleavened bread. Jesus said, this bread that you hold in my hand, your hand, he said to his early disciples, this is my body which is broken for you. Uh, this, we don't take the Lord's Supper in order to digest the Lord's body. But we do take the Lord's Supper to be reminded of what God gave up for you and me. He loved us enough to leave the glory of heaven, to walk among men, to be shamed and rejected and despised by men, to be beaten to the point of non-recognition from his own disciples. All because he loved us. He gave himself for us. And he reminds us that when we eat of this, eat of this bread, to be reminded of the gift of God's presence, his gift of his body to you and I, in order that we might be able to find encouragement and strength for the journey of life ahead. So Father, bless this wafer as we take it today. Use it to strengthen us and encourage us for this day. In Jesus' name, would you eat with me please? There is another layer, be gentle, that, redu that removes the cover from the top of the juice. It's a little cup of grape juice. Jesus looked at his disciples and said to them that evening, he said, when you take of this cup, be reminded of the blood that was shed for you. About 2,000 years ago, Jesus crawled up, on, crawled up on an old rugged cross. His hands and feet were nailed to a cross. His side was pierced later. His blood was shed on Calvary in order that he might pay for the sins that you and I commit. Without the shedding of blood, there is no payment for sins. So as we partake of this juice today, would you be reminded today personally that Jesus shed his blood to pay for my your sin would you take it with the gratitude that it needs to take I owed a debt I could not pay he paid a debt he did not own, owe but today I sing a brand new song amazing grace because of what Jesus did for you and me father bless this juice today may it remind us of the gift and the price that you paid for my sin debt and we'll thank you for it in Jesus name would you drink with me please